out of the gate, I want to make sure we thank all of our sponsors who are making this possible. So big thanks to our lead sponsor, Hunger Mountain Co-op. Uh, we also want to thank Onion River Outdoors. We want to thank Greenvest, Capital Copy, and Union Mutual as well for making this possible. Um, our Naturals Journeys online series, we've been doing this for, I think this is our 25th year or thereabouts. Um, and, uh, and though we are bringing it uh, online this year, and it's a little more difficult to convene in person, obviously, with that comes some silver linings that we can bring in some wonderful folks from all around the country who otherwise wouldn't necessarily be able to bring up to um, Montpelier. And, uh, and Matt is no exception there. So we're really glad to have uh, Matt with us. Um, we do a bunch of programs at the Nature Center around apples. Um, it's one of our favorite things to talk about because it's this beautiful mixture of natural history and cultural history on our landscape. And, uh, and um, all of us on staff at the Nature Center have been wanting to learn more about the, the story of our apples. Um, and so we've been searching for just the right person to, uh, to, to come and, and present for us. And so we've found that person in Matt. Um, Matt is also known as Gnarly Pippin and is the author of The Wild Apple Forager's Guide. He's coming to us from, uh, from the orchards of is it Hadley, Massachusetts or thereabouts, yep. I believe. Yep, that's right. Um, so uh, it's our pleasure to welcome you, Matt. I'll say um, one more time, just in terms of housekeeping, feel free to please throw any questions that you have as we go into the chat bar and I'll moderate them as we go. And um, keep your microphone off and um, yeah, enjoy. Matt, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Sean. Thanks for having me. Um, thank you for everyone tuning in. I'm delighted to see so many uh, places from all over the lower 48 and I guess Canada too. It's pretty awesome. So I'm gonna give you guys a little introduction to myself before um, we sort of break into the presentation. And as we, as we go, I'll sort of be giving uh, Sean direction to go next slide or go back a couple slides. Um, but anyway, um, a little about myself. My name is Matt Kaminsky, as Sean mentioned. Uh, people, um, in the Apple world, know me as Gnarly Pippins, which is also the name of my website and blog, uh, where I post a lot of essays and, um, you know, waxings and other kinds of uh, writings on on wild apples, primarily. Um, a little bit of my work in the cultivated orchards bleeds into that a little bit. Um, I've written a couple books on apples, which. Uh, might, you know, might share a couple tidbits from those um, as we go on here. Um, but really wild apples are my passion. I, I have been dealing with wild apple trees for um, about eight years uh, since, since I began working in um, orchards during my undergraduate years in college. I went to Hampshire where they have a whole myriad uh, different blocks of old abandoned apple trees, not wild, but cultivated. And in deciding that I was interested in apples, I would work these trees a little bit, little by little learning as I went along, um, slowly but surely getting my bearings with how to care for apple trees in an orchard setting. And then later on finding on the outskirts of some of these old you know, groups of trees, on the edge of the woods where the, the woods really meet the, the grassy understory of the orchard, um, we found all these different wild apple trees that were sort of hidden. And at first I was trying to you know, find answers, think, all right, what, what is going on here? Like, what are these apples? What are these trees? And then as I did more research and did a little more learning, um, really found out what wild apples are. And um, that has been a, years long pursuit and it's never ending. Um, I've got some of my favorite wild apples with me, um, which are keeping me company. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Probably at the end, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about these specific wild apples that I have in, in front of me. Um, you can see I've got many different shapes and colors uh, and that's part of the exciting part of wild apples. They're all so very different. Um, but I think that I would like to start our uh, slideshow. If Sean want to go to the first slide there. Awesome. So this is a great primer shot. You know, I'm very, 
I'm a very visual learner and I hope that some of these, these photos that I've included will help you guys, um, you know, piece together some of the concepts and get a, a more full picture of what, what we're really talking about when we talk about wild apples. Now, I want to, you know, be clear. I know some of you may totally know a lot of the background on what constitutes wild apples versus cultivated apples and, you know, maybe more, um, you know, experienced than others who may not have that same experience around wild apples in theory or practice. But hopefully we can cover a lot of ground. Um, so anyway, I'll start with this photo, which is taken um, from last year's harvest, which was a very good harvest in our part of Western New England um, of just, you know, basically the spoils from a, a good day out foraging apples. Um, and you can see there's a lot of a lot of variety here. So that big box in front, that's 15 bushels worth. And then there's a, you know, four, four stragglers. So you've got a, a pretty serious amount of wild apples here. And, you know, I, um, the first thing that always strikes me is just the sheer variety. And that is probably the most fundamental thing to know about wild apples versus cultivated apples. Obviously, there are a lot of varieties of apples that have been named and that have some kind of recognition. Um, of course, we're all dropping the names of our favorite apples in the, uh, in the chat box there. But wild apples, in contrast with the, the cultivated ones whose names that we know, were, um, you know, they, they basically have one thing in common with the cultivated apples. And that is that the original tree grew from a seed rather than being grafted. So any of you guys have ever grafted before um, or have some apple trees in your yard or something, you know that if you, um, if you have a, like a Macintosh tree or a Northern Spy tree, that tree had to get grafted at some point. So that's typically done by an experienced, you know, nursery person. And that's a, you know, a, a method of propagation that is, it's clonal in nature. It's not, um, like sexual reproduction of plants where you're relying on seeds and pollination, but you're actually joining two specimens. Imagine I have like, you know, a pen cap and a pen. You're literally just joining two things together that previously were separate. Um, so this grafting is basically uh, us controlling this uncontrollable habit of apples, which we call heterozygosity, which is like a long biological word that some of you might recognize from like biology class. Um, but heterozygosity meaning hetero, different, and zygous, genes, right? So different genes is the makeup of that word heterozygous. And apples are known to be extremely heterozygous in their, in their reproduction. So if you look at all of the genes in the apple that contain, um, you know, that, that control different characteristics about a fruit, the stem's length, the color of the apple, red versus yellow, um, the size, and then things that have more to do with the tree than the fruit, you know, the height of the tree, the shape of the leaf, uh, you know, so on and so forth. Every seed that gets planted is going to be totally unique. And when I say unique, I mean truly unique. So if you took um, all 10 seeds out of an apple and planted them and grew 10 different trees um, from the seeds of one single apple, you would get 10 trees that produce vastly different fruits. You'd get ones that produce something very large. You'd get ones that produce something very, very small. Some would be sweet, sour. Um, so this is what I mean when I say heterozygous. They have this extremely different expression that prevents them from reproducing faithfully to their parent. Now that's that that's um not you necessarily unique to apples. There are other tree crops like you know pears and you know other tree fruits that have that heterozygosity, um, but none are as extreme in their in in how they're pronounced as as they are in apples, which is really, um, you know, kind of a miracle for us because if any of us are concerned with biodiversity and food systems, you know, the apples 
wild apples are almost like a little bit of a miracle crop in that way, because not only do they have that tendency to um, produce a really, really vast uh, genetic expression that you get all different sort of things from, you know, a small pile of seeds, but um, they also exist in the landscape without human intervention, hence the wild part of it, the feral apples part of it. So that's, that's a, another important thing to point out. So when we look at, you know, the, the world of apples, all the documented apples of the world, and there are a lot, there are tens of thousands that have been documented with names and uh, written history. Um, and if some of you are really interested in nerding out about this stuff, you can see behind me, I've got this sort of encyclopedia line of books right behind me. That's, that is the illustrated history of apples in the United States and Canada by Dan Bussey. And that's a very good book for you if you're <laughs> interested in really, really digging deep into this. But it just goes to show you how many different apples have been cataloged and named. There are tens of thousands and you have tens of thousands in that collection right there. And re the reason why that's significant other than that just being a huge number is that every one of those originally started as a seedling tree. So we use the word seedling sometimes as being synonymous with the word wild when we're talking about apple trees because any tree that was grown from seed rather than a tree that was grafted is going to produce something unique, something new, something that um, even if it maybe resembles a cultivated variety, still no one has ever seen or tasted it before. So I know there's a lot of like crazy concepts going on there. Um, and I, I guess maybe some of those go beyond the bounds of this image that's before you. Um, but well, well, you know, I hope I hope that we can continue to sort of make sense of that. And uh, it boggles my mind too sometimes. But um, yeah, let's let's go to the next photo. And we'll continue to sort of draw that line between, uh, you know, what a wild apple is and what a cultivated apple is. And so, this photo here, uh, this is, as you can see on the the sort of the title heading of that big strip of paper. This is. Uh, a sort of a portable display that I assembled from last year's first annual wild and seedling pomological exhibition. That was an event that um, I organized as part of, as sort of a kickoff to Franklin County Cider Days, which is a, a, a very long standing celebration of apples and cider that we have here in Western Mass in Franklin County all over the region really. It's gone beyond the county's borders at this point. Um, but this is a cool photo to share, I think, because it does, it does illustrate a little bit of the, of the range of phenotypes of, of actual expressions of fruit that apples are capable of producing. Um, you know, if you, if you, you might have to look a little closer, you know, like, you know, get your, get your head close to the screen or something, but there's tiny, tiny little crab apples on this page. There are really huge, just really large, large apples, the size of apples you might get at the grocery store, you know, so you've got this huge range and then all, all the different colors in the spectrum as well represented here. And so not only does this show you the range of things that wild apple trees are capable of producing, if you know a little bit about the event, then it'll show you, um, another adaptation of the apple tree, which is that uh, this event I organized, the, the way that we conducted it was by putting out uh, basically a, a call to all apple foragers, all wild apple foragers who take part in the work of exploring for wild apples. Um, and we were accepting pears too, you know, pears and apples having some close taxonomical relations. We, we weren't gonna rule out the pears, but anyone who takes part in that that work of fruit exploring and has some, some, some varieties that they're excited about, we ask that they send uh, samples of that through the mail to, to me, I was processing all of the, the submissions, um, you know, so that we could feature them in this exhibition, which would be sort of a celebration of wild apples 
um, organized under sort of one, one big event. So it was a huge success and we promoted, I guess, better than uh, I had expected. And we received, um, all, you know, we, we received 160 submissions. And of those, uh, we got them from uh, several different parts of Canada. We got them from British Columbia, from Quebec and Ontario. We got apples from all the different states in New England, New York, you know, most parts of the mid-Atlantic. We got apples from the Midwest and the Great Plains. We got apples from the Mountain West, Colorado and Nevada and California. And we also got some from sort of the, the Southern California, like mountainous region outside of San Diego. So we even got some like subtropical, um, high desert arid climate fruit. So if you look at this smattering of apples and think about, wow, so these are not only just you know, vastly different apples, um, they come from a very wide geography. So we think that, you know, is pretty significant for a couple of reasons. And that, that demonstrates this adaptive ability of apple trees, of malice, which is the, the genus in which all apple trees are contained. There's this adaptive nature that they have to basically, um, you know, find some, some, you know, selection of their, their genome that can really thrive in, uh, in a given climate. And that includes climates that you might not think of apples as thriving, like in the desert, like in, in Arizona or Nevada or Southern California near the Mojave. So if you, if you apply that sort of thinking, and look at the history of apples and where they originated. Um, you know, we're talking really, really long spans of time here, like geological spans of time. And you go back to the center of biological diversity, which is in Kazakhstan, um, sort of on the Kazakhstan-China border in Northern Asia. There's a mountain range that is widely accepted as sort of the center of biological diversity or like the ancestral home of apples. And you look at, you know, apples as being relatively endemic to that area at one point in geological history and then through um, human activity as well as other mammalian um, transport, apples by way of seed dispersal gradually migrated uh, across the Eurasian continent. And then, of course, with uh, colonization, you have apples reach going from Europe to the, to the Americas. So if you look at all those geographies too, you have even more sort of unique climates that um, you know, all have this common history of apple cultivation. So if we think about why that happened, you have to go back to that same trait that I just described, heterozygosity. The fact that apples have this ability to spit out remixes of the genome, you know, one after another. And thanks to natural selection, you have Mother Nature working her magic, selecting out the ones that are not going to thrive and allowing those which are going to succeed in a certain set of conditions to persist and cast their seed ever widening with that heterozygous nature, one after another, each generation of seedling trees that grows enough to, to cast some fruit and cast some seed, will cast its seed. And then there's this you know, new generation of possibilities for new and interesting apples. So if you look at the very short history of apples in um, North America, you look at um, you know when, when seeds were brought from Europe to the, the Americas, you have basic, you know, a little, little more than 300 years, 350 or so years of time where apples have been here. You see over that course of time, which is very short in the grand scheme of things, an absolute explosion of apples in the natural landscape. Um, 
of course, there are some indigenous species of crab apples that have always been on the North American continent. However, those are all, for the most, you know, generally speaking, very, very small, small, tiny, unusable crabs. About, you know, if you look at this as your, your typical crab apple that you might want to do something with, <laughs> um, you know, a lot of a lot of the crab apples that are indigenous are, you know, maybe one tenth or even less the size of something like this, and we're generally not used as a food crop, um, even by First Nations peoples. Um, generally used to attract game or uh, just fed the birds. Um, but in the 350 years since fruit has, you know, cultivated seeds from cultivated fruit were brought from Europe to the Americas, you've got um, really just an, an astounding uh, increase in the amount of apples that are just present in the landscape. And that really does reach beyond human intervention. Obviously, we have a culture of orcharding. Everyone here has probably either planted an apple tree or, or dealt in some way with cultivated apple trees. Um, but they, they have taken residence uh, on their own. And so that's where I want to sort of start drawing um, a little bit more of a distinction visually and conceptually about what wild apples look like in the landscape and what cultivated apples look like in landscape, how you might, um, if you're not sure how to make those distinctions, how you would make those distinctions um, if you're out for a walk and you stumble upon a group of apple trees or an orchard and you're wondering about what you're looking at. Um, and uh, yeah, just just keep digging deeper into, into this wild apple thing. So yeah, if we want to go to the next slide. Oh, this is another another good one. Um, so on the left, I, I put this in here because it's an it's another good illustration of the different things, the different characters that you're likely to encounter when you really start looking for wild apples. So we have two wild apples here, but that were grown under very different circumstances and whose trees basically are situated in two very different places. So the, the tree on the left, um, or the fruit on the left. Um, this fruit looks honestly more like a cherry. It's got this eccentrically long stem and really uh, kind of almost perfectly spherical. Uh, and, you know, it's a crab apple. It's pretty small, but this is a tree that I've been following for years and years. I come, I go to it every year and it's growing on a pretty major highway, uh, but there's a nice parking lot right next to it. So it's easy access. Um, so if, if that, if that description indicates anything to you, you know already that this is not your typical apple tree location. It's, you know, it's on the side of a road and you got to park in like a public establishment's parking lot to get access to the tree. So that's, that's tree A. I call that Wilmington Hideout. That's a name I've given that tree. On the right, you've got quite a large apple and that comes from another another seedling tree but this one is situated in the backyard of some of, of someone who has been you know doing your typical human lawn care regimen so this wild apple tree situated in the middle of a grassy lawn and uh plenty of plenty of grass for the apples to fall down on they they come out very nice no bruises or anything every year so you got wild apples in two very different landscapes. Um, and that has an impact on, you know, how you're gonna deal with the fruit, how you're gonna harvest it. But really it just goes to show uh, how adaptive these trees are and how, how, how disparate the locations you can be in and still sort of find them are. So I hope that um, I can give you guys some tips on how to spot it. If you go to the next, next slide, that's the one I really wanted to get to. All right, here. So these are not wild apple trees, but cultivated apple trees. Um, another very common site. I know that you know a lot of us are, are calling in from New England. Um, most of the places that aren't in New England, I think probably have a lot of abandoned orchards um, hanging around as well. But this is a picture of an abandoned, well, so not really fully abandoned. It's, I've been working on pruning it and bringing it back into production for a few years, but this is one of the most important things to look for uh, when you're 
you know, encountering uh, some population of apple trees and you're wondering what the story is. One of the, the major tips in deciding whether something is a seedling or whether something is cultivated is by looking not at the fruit, but at the tree itself. So that's an important thing. Reading the trees, if you're curious about wild versus cultivated is very important. And one of the most important things to remember is that apple trees need to have two in order to fruit. You know, they have this, this sterility thing that happens where they need two different specimens in order to cross pollinate in the springtime when the apples uh, flower and therefore be able to produce their fruit if they don't have, if there's just a single apple tree, unless it is a rare case of being a self-fertile variety, then they won't be able to pollinate and they won't you, won't, you won't have any fruit at all. So if you find an apple tree and it's planted in rows uh, with other apple, one other apple tree, and it looks like it's in some kind of arrangement that you know, humans, as a rule, humans love straight lines and will always make every effort to put them not necessarily in a straight line, but in some kind of arrangement that would insinuate, okay, this was planted. This is very likely a cultivated apple. So that's one hint. The other hint that we look for, and I don't actually have a great photo of this because oftentimes these are located right at the base of the ground and it's hard to capture in a photo but sometimes you'll see sort of like a, a lump, a lump in the tree before the, the trunk extends straight upward. And that lump usually denotes a graft union. So literally a scar tissue that formed where the graft of the apple tree was done so that you have the uh, desired variety of fruit above and the rootstock below. All the trees in this photo, these were grafted about 80 years ago. And we don't know exactly what they grafted them onto, but we have a variety called Cortland, which many of you must be familiar with, um, that's growing on these trees. Um, and of course, they're all planted in these perfectly straight rows, very long, very grid-like. And that tells us right off the bat that if we, if we stumbled upon this in the landscape, we know immediately uh, this is all cultivated variety. Um, you know, all the, all the trunks themselves, since the trees were just saplings, have been pruned with a single trunk so that they, um, you know, they have that, that typical tree form of one trunk extending up until the, the actual fruit branching begins. That's another um, indicator of a cultivated tree versus a, a wild tree. On the other hand, which is typically not planted in rows, usually has, it, you know, more than likely has multiple trunks and is very twisty and gnarly and ha has lots of dead, maybe, you know, not necessarily lots, but might have, might have some more dead wood in the canopy, obviously not being cared for. Now that's a little bit more of a gray area because abandoned orchards made up of cultivated fruit often do get sort of neglected and left behind. Um, but uh, you have much more of a wild kind of gnarly look to them. So if we go to the next slide, you can get that, that contrast. Very different. So this is one of my new discoveries. This is a wild apple tree. So obviously it's a very young tree, it's pretty small, but um, I love the situation of this tree. It's growing in, and basically in a very cultivated or very um, highly managed environment like a roadside. It's growing in the one place that is basically untouched by humans. It's growing in the space between the, the triangulation cable or a telephone pole and the telephone pole itself. And whatever mower, mower device, the Department of Public Works was using to clear the grass off the roadside, they were not able to fit that mower head into the space between the telephone pole and the cable. So this is a perfect example of how nature and wild apples are basically, um, you know, able, able to reproduce independent of human 
human management. Um, and that's deeply inspiring to me for certain reasons, but um, it's, you know, this tree has red leaves. It's in its fall foliage. So this, this particular variety turns red in the fall rather than yellow or orange. Um, and actually happens to be a very red apple that's red on the inside too, which is a, a neat rare thing. But um, if, we, if we just sort of think about the traits that I was just describing about the cultivated apple, compare that with the traits of wild apples. So instead of one trunk, you have multiple little trunks. Um, often they're a little smaller and there's many of them, almost in, like in, in more of a bush, apple bush configuration, although they, they really are trees by rights. Um, there is not a whole lot of dead wood per se, but right on the, in the interior of the tree, um, um, just between that, that first little metal wire on the right and then the pole itself, there is a little dead branch that was hit a little bit by the mower. It's kind of hard to see in that photo, but again, another clue, if there's dead wood in the tree and um, it's otherwise in a managed environment, this tree is not really being cared for. So another indicator, yep, no one's, no one's looking after the tree, probably not something someone planted. Um, and of course, if there's multiple trunks that are all producing the same foliage and the same fruit, that would insinuate that there's no graft. Because if you graft a tree and there does happen to be multiple growths uh, from the ground, and they're different. You know, if you have one trunk that has this kind of fruit and then one of the smaller sprouts from the ground that's going off to one side, you know, has a different leaf characteristic that's pretty distinctive or the fruit is just totally different, then you've certainly got a grafted tree on your hands because you've got the, the root stock expressing itself both in the, the leaves and the fruit. And then you've got the, the desired, the original desired variety of fruit that was grafted growing and expressing itself too. So those are, those are three of the most uh, important things to keep in mind when you're trying to uh, distinguish wild versus cultivated. In, in my book, The Wild Apple Foragers Guide, I have a little flow chart called Planted or Pippin. Pippin is a nickname uh, that we give to seedling apples. So planted or pippin is sort of that's that's the the distinction process and there there are other little things if you guys have more questions about that feel free to hang on to them at the end or drop those in the in the chat um let's go to the next slides keep this moving all right so this is another photo that helps illustrate that um that distinction between the wild apple form and the cultivated form. Um, but additionally, this helps to show you another sort of circumstance that you might see wild apples in. So what you're looking at here is what I think of as like gold medal wild apple management. So you've got basically every, every tree that you see in this photo, all of them are apple trees, all of them wild, self-seeded. Um, and this kind of landscape, sort of a wild apple grove or like a little wild apple forest is more common than you might expect um, in this day and age in New England um, and in other parts of the, yeah, the temperate, temperate world. And the reason why that is, is because there's this tendency for, um, ecosystems to sort of revolve around the, the trees that occupy a certain area. So what you're looking at here is partly nature's doing and partly um, a little bit of human intervention to keep this clean and open and accessible. Um, and the story behind this, this particular place is that, it, you know, like many places in, in de certainly in Vermont, definitely in Massachusetts and much of the, much of the, you know, temperate North American states, you know, where dairy farming at one point was a big, big agricultural industry. You have tons and tons of acres of pasture. So grassland, no trees, that is um, essentially aging out. That's not, you know, dairy being less and less profitable for 
uh, unfortunate reasons, uh, cows and acreage that were being used to manage large herds of dairy cattle are gradually being moved into other types of land use. Sometimes they just grow back into forest. Sometimes they continue to be pasture, but oftentimes those pastures begin to get populated with trees. So um, that in combination with a, a source of seed in the area, you have you know, wild animals, deer and porcupines and squirrels and birds and bears bringing apple seed into the area from some apple tree that someone planted once or from other wild apple trees in the area, finding some kind of refuge that they can, they can take root in open grassland. One thing to remember about apple trees is that generally they're smaller than are big forest timber trees. They're like, uh, we call it edge species. So a species that really does like that forest soil, um, but they really can't survive without um, some access to sunlight. They can't grow in total shade the way a sugar maple can survive in total shade and remain small for like 20 or 30 years and then shoot way up when there's a hole in the canopy that opens up when a tree falls. You know, apples, they do need that sunlight. So in a pasture situation, apple seed can very easily germinate and take root. And even if it's mowed or grazed several times, that vigorous seedling power that can power through and it can take root in, in pasture very well. So old pastures are a really, really good place to find wild apples or seedling apples. Oftentimes, you have many apples growing, you know, in profusion at once. And most of the time they're accompanied by other early succession trees like black cherry and buckthorn. You might have some buckthorn trees growing in. Um, sumac is common. Elm also very common. That's like an early succession regrowth of a grassland back into woodland. Um, but apple is very common. And if you are involved in the management of land um, that's in that sort of transitional phase between grassland and going either back into woodland or vice versa. You've got, you know, an old pasture that went to forest or early succession woodland and you want to bring it sort of back into some more of an open canopy thing. You have the ability to select what species you want to take in there. So that's what this photo represents. It's early succession forest that had this sort of little diverse mix of tree species, including seedling apples, wild apples. And a lot of the other trees were cut out to allow the apples to grow big and populate and make a bit of a wild orchard. So the understory here, as you can see, is a lot of like really gentle, kind of easy, easy plants, good for, good for mowers, good for scythes, good for apples to fall on the ground and not get impaled by like sharp goldenrod stems or other kinds of veins of the fruit foragers existence. Um, so I really can consider that to be one of the best ways to establish a relationship with wild apples because in these types of places where wild apples do tend to thrive in, in little, you know, isolated populations, you get to know, um, many more wild apple trees than you would say in your roadside volunteer, your one or two on the side of the road in a given place. Um, or, you know, just just your, your chance seedlings as we call them. So um, if any of you happen to be, you know, in, involved in that style of land management, then this is something to keep in mind as you go forward. And additionally, if you find something like this, then you've definitely found something special. Um, obviously, as you can see in this photo, all the trees seem to have this very different growth habit. Um, sort of that one in the foreground on the left has this really wavy kind of wavy gnarly looking shape, whereas the one just to its right has a tendency to grow really upright and very brushy. So um, much as you might believe that that has something to do with the way they're being managed, they actually don't get managed very much. Um, that has more to do with the tree's genetics and how an apple's growth habit as a tree's growth habit can differ from one species or one um, 
seedling apple specimen to the next. So I wish that you could see all these in fruit because that that's really the, the best thing ever. <laughs> you can be uh, almost like a kid in a candy store tasting all these different apples, like just walking through a little wild apple forest. It's pretty cool. Let's go to the next photo now. Um, while we're going to the next slide, a quick question that I had for you. Um, yeah. I'm th just thinking about kind of the timeline of, of uh, orchards in, in our landscape. Do you ever come across um, situations where we have, um, where you see what looks like a grove of pippins that's really growing from the drops of an old planted orchard that is no longer there. That was, that's, that's died and rotted away or is cut down or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, in any, in any like wild apple scenario, you have to consider that there, there's got to be a source of seed nearby and some, some wild apple fanatics will spend more time considering um, parentage than others. But those that do spend time considering parentage when examining the traits of a seedling apple will, um, you know, you think, you think back to, okay, well, this apple has this kind of characteristic. Where would it have come from? Oh, I know an orchard in the area that is now gone, but they used to have this one variety that seems to have this kind of one peculiarity that showed up in the seedling. So um, that's just one example, but, but you know, so often the place to go looking for, for wild apples is, oh, well, there, there's an old abandoned orchard there. Let's go check it out and see if we find anything cool. Oftentimes the abandoned orchard doesn't have much fruit, but the, the wild apples that grew as the offspring from those old trees are, are generally the prize that you take home at the end of the day because um, well, wild apples are just interesting generally, but they are also, in my opinion, more, more fit for survival without that human cultivation. So you very, very often um, where they're where there's smoke, there's fire. Where there's where there's apple trees, there are more apple trees. So yeah, good question. And the answer is yes, a resounding yes. <clears throat> if there's uh, no more questions, I'll, I'll sort of switch gears a little bit now with this next slide and talk a little bit less about theory of wild apples and sort of the conceptual stuff and a little bit more of the how to or a little, little more some more practical suggestions um, that I want to share with all of you. Um, this photo I took this year in September, a little earlier this year, um, and this was just a morning drive. I was, I, I was going on a little mission. I wanted to find some really sharp, high acid kind of apples that we were going to use to blend in some cider that we were pressing at Carr's Cider House, which is the cider house that I work for. Um, and what I ended up finding was one of the oldest wild apple trees that I've personally dealt with. And I'm, you know, obviously you can't say exactly how old an apple tree is unless you really do some serious um, examination, but just the, the size of the trunks alone, of which there are multiple, uh, was pretty tremendous. So this was a really huge, huge wild apple tree. It gave me lots of apples and um, there's two parts of this photo that are interesting and important to talk about. The first one is actually not the fruit, but how, um, how to gather it. So when you're, you know, um, you know, harvesting, when you're harvesting apples, you think of wearing a, like a tote on your shoulders that has a basket and you've got, you've got this picturesque apple picking kind of viewpoint. And that might be partly from experiences harvesting apples or just, just the preconceived notion that all food is gathered by hand, yada, yada, yada. That much is true. We do gather the apples by hand, but in the, in the case of wild apples that aren't pruned and managed intentionally to get the, the fruiting zone of the tree to be within, you know, um, arm's reach or even a ladder's reach in some cases. In the case of this tree that's pictured here, this tree I had to climb up like 25 or 30 feet to get at any of the fruit, but I wasn't picking it one by one. 
the way that I and and the vast majority of folks in dealing with wild apples get the fruit off of the tree is um, picking it off the ground. And we do that by either shaking it, by climbing it and vigorously shaking the branches individually, or we use one of several devices, um, very, very old rudimentary technology um, to shake the apples out of the tree. Um, and a little bit of that has to do with gauging ripeness and assessing the fruit. Um, but just another word about the devices that we might use if you're not interested in climbing 30 feet up an apple tree and shaking yourself crazy out of it, um, hopefully not out of it, but um, one of the easiest ways to make yourself a little apple harvesting tool companion is to take a long sapling, um, like, you know, uh, something, something that you can really grab onto, and this is your handle, 10 or 12 feet, maybe a little longer is ideal, 14, 15 feet, and screw a hook into the end of it, like a threaded wall hook that you might hang a bicycle on in a garage or something. And that you can hook around the, the you know, a, a, a crook in a branch that's laden with fruit and shake that and all the apples on that branch will come down and you repeat that on each branch that you want to harvest the apples from until you've got what, you've look, what you're looking for. We call that a panking stick. That's the official term. So you can use a panking stick. Um, if you have a high tech telescoping pole, you can make a panking stick that's telescoping and you can get like maybe a 20 or 25 foot reach. That's a really great thing to do. Um, but the thing I want you all to realize is that we're not like picking the apples one by one, we're shaking them, we're gathering them off the ground. Sometimes um, you don't even have to shake them. Sometimes all the apples end up on the ground before you've discovered the tree and they're all down there. And it's up to you, the forager, the fruit explorer, to decide whether they are of a quality that you would like or if they're not. So obviously a little bit of that is, is tasting the fruit. So. A lot of people will say, oh, you shouldn't, you shouldn't eat apples off the ground, they'll make you sick. Um, I might have a little bit more bravery in terms of eating food off the floor than other people, but I assure you it is totally safe and you have to use a little discretion if there's like a pile of deer poop or something next to it. You might not take that particular apple, but um, apples that are on the ground or in the soil are just fine. So, one of the best ways to expose the apples that you're either already on the ground or those that um, you wish to shake down um, is to use a scythe or, you know, cause it's, if you're out there foraging, it's more than likely that you're trying to cover a lot of ground. You might've had to walk, you know, hike in from the road a little ways. You're not gonna bring a lawnmower and you're not gonna bring a weed whacker. You know, you need something that's a little lighter that you can take with you. So I hope some of you have already uh, started to engage with scythe work um, in your daily lives. Um, but if you haven't already, your love and zeal for wild apples might be the perfect gateway because they are really the perfect tool for the job. If you can see in this photo, um, not only have I cleared the understory up to the tree, you can see next to it what it looked like before. That's mostly Japanese knotweed and some other nasty vines like grapevine and Virginia creeper. Uh, but not, not only have I cleared the ground, but that vegetation, you can, you can sort of lay it over and that creates a bit of a cushion for the apples that you're gonna fall, that are gonna fall from, you know, quite a ways up, 20 or 30 feet sometimes, sometimes more, sometimes 40 feet. Um, you know, they're, if, they, if they impact the earth or if they hit something hard like stone, then they're going to bruise and that's going to impact their ability to store, uh, which is important. You know, it, it's sometimes you, you can get really excited and just be like, oh, I got to get the apples no matter what. And you don't take those precautions. But if you do take the time, it's not a lot of time often just to make a little pass with the scythe might take you two or three minutes. But um, it's quite worth it because you will really be rewarded when in fruit quality and ease of, of picking and gathering. So I really recommend that in terms, th those two things to bring with you, bring a scythe and a panking stick and make sure your scythe is good and sharp because most of the time it's not cutting like 
cutting a lawn, you know, you're cutting, you're cutting through some nasty stuff, Japanese knotweed and Virginia creeper and that sort of thing. So it can take, they can take a little elbow grease, but it's very worth it. Um, and then the other thing that this photo represents, you have to assess the fruit. So in this photo, we have, um, you know, a name, a nameless wild apple and it happens to be one of the most acidic, sharp, crazy tasting things I've ever had. And I thought, okay, this is perfect. But of course, not every apple is gonna to be to your liking. So you have to make that determination whether it's worth it or not to put in the work to gather it and say, okay, well, if I'm just looking for enough apples that are sort of sweet and sort of tart to make a pie or something, you have to, you have to rate them along uh, a gradient. Most of the time, and myself included, I forage apples primarily for use in cider and for just eating or dehydrating uh, for personal use. And for cider, we have a much wider range of um, flavors that not only are acceptable, but are desirable in the, in the, in the finished product. And so um, something that's outrageously acidic, we can blend that with something that's a little sweeter or a little bittersweet, you know, something along those lines uh, with, with pleasing results. Now, things that I would look for to avoid, not from a flavor assessment standpoint, but from um, more of a quality or, or ripeness standpoint is you have to know how to assess ripeness in the apple. When you bite the apple, um, you know, it, so, some people use the word mealy, kind of willy-nilly, but mealiness is not, um, no apple was born mealy. If, if the apple tastes really, really super granular and dry and, and it has that classic rotten apple kind of mealiness, then it's past ripe. It's much overripe. The apple should have brown seeds. It shouldn't be white. If the seeds are white or in any way not like really that dark brown, they should be about the color of like black coffee, un, uncreamed coffee. Um, then if they, that, that's, that's the color of the seeds when they're ripe. If they're lighter than that, then they're it's still underripe. Um, and thirdly, when a tree has ripened all of its fruit, roughly 20% of that fruit will be on the ground. Um, so the tree lets go of some of that fruit when it's ripe. If you shake the tree with your handy panking stick and fruit doesn't really come down super easily, you feel like you have to shake it super vigorously in order to get anything off, then you might have harvested some underripe apples. In some cases, that's okay. In other cases, that's not really super okay. And I think the next slide will show you an example. I think, I can't remember the order. Yes, I got it right. So this photo is, um, this is a, actually a, a cultivated variety of a crab apple called the hislop crab that ripens uh, late in summer in, in like August, early September. And, um, even though it's not truly a wild apple, I brought this photo because I thought, okay, it's a great example of underripe apples and what that looks like when it's harvested. So the three crates that have all those leaves in them, those leaves are connected to the, to the woody stem that the apple is connected to. Also on that woody stem is a flower bud, a dormant flower bud that the tree produced for next year's bloom. So if you harvest, if you, if you determine, come to a determination that uh, this tree's not quite ripe, but I really want it, so I'm gonna go get those apples. And you notice that the tree, or you know, that it's not releasing the apples quite right, and you go for it anyway, then you might be like um, sacrificing, jeopardizing, the tree's bounty for the following year, which not only is a sacrifice of, of the tree's energy that it's already invested, that's also just a bummer for you because if, you know, you got to think about tomorrow while you're living today. So um, that's, that's part of it. And the other part is that if you're going to actually use any of these, you have to do so much more work to get those leaves off and get the twigs off. So if you, if you see that the, the twigs are coming off with stems, 
or even twigs and leaves coming off with the stem of the apple and the fruit itself, then you've got underripe fruit. The tree will release that fruit when it's ripe. And if it's not releasing it, then you're not ready. So this is an example of what not to do. This was a photo from many, many years ago. And we don't make that mistake anymore. So um, we don't need to dwell on that too long <laughs> on that. Uh, and, and here, this is, this is a photo. I'll circle back to you know, how to harvest. But this is a view that you get very used to, the view of a road from inside of an apple tree. And from this like point of view kind of photo, you can see that, okay, I'm sort of standing on that branch, sort of a forked branch that um, sort of gradually divides in, into those little teeny branch tips with all the apples on them. But I'm standing on those where they're pretty thick. And I might, you know, take one of my hands all the while you're, you're imagining you're in this tree right now. So just zoom in and just picture it. But you know, you might take one of your hands and hold, hold that branch that's in like the, the upper left corner to stable yourself while you just sort of like dance on the branches and like stomp on them and sort of jounce them back and forth really quickly and try to get all the apples to fall off. That's the kind of thing that you wanna do if you're, if you're interested in climbing the trees. Now, obviously, um, some people might not want to do that for safety reasons, uh, which I get, you know, you have to climb at your own discretion. My personal favorite is, way to get the apples out of the tree is by hand and is, is by climbing and shaking. Um, so this is a view that you get very used to if you're, if you're in the same boat as me. Now this photo might also be uh, of some utility because if you picture this as being also like the tree's perspective and you um, happen to be using your pegging stick and you're on the ground, you look at a tree like this and you think, all right, where am I going to put that, that, where am I going to hook that hook in order to get the best, you know, shake off of the tree? And the answer to that is you're, you're going to have to seat the, the hook on the union of two branches. You don't want to put it on a length of straight wood with no knots or no twigs on it and then shake it crazy because then you run the risk of that hook sliding along the surface and distressing the bark and opening that up to some you know any any kind of disease or um other other ailments other pathogens and the reason why i want to say that is because when you're when you're shaking the tree, you're not causing any harm to it as long as you're not actually causing like an impact or some kind of abrasion to the bark. And as you know, these are wild trees. They're, they're wild and renewable resource, but you don't want to go into this with, with you know, uh, you, want, you want to be a forager with integrity. You want to keep the tree as healthy as it was when you found it. And if you, if you harvest recklessly, you know, and you hurt the tree, and that's a bummer because the tree might not recover and, and produce fruit as well. You know, I've made those mistakes and I, you know, I like to give people that piece of advice because uh, it's important to keep in mind while you're, especially when you're getting into it, because um, that level of experience will help you uh, determine uh, what level of shaking is too much, whatever, you know, if you hear a little split in the branch, you think, uh oh, you might have to come back in the middle of the winter and prune it off. Um, so anyhow, that's that. I think I have one more fun picture of a of of up in a tree. And that was that that same tree that um, I had the scythe in the picture. And this is just to illustrate sometimes how high you get when you're trying to get the fruit out. This was this was the highest of the year. Um, but another familiar view of the road from inside the apple tree. Um, so no need to stay on that one for too long. Now, lastly, this is the last, I know we're pushing the time, it's 8.01 here, but this is, this is an important thing to remember. Tarps are your friend, drop cloths are your friend. Uh, if you have a tarp hanging around and you wanna go forage some apples, it's much more efficient to assess that the tree's ripe. So you may, might shake a branch very lightly as a sample and see how many fall off. Or you might taste one of the fruits on the ground and say, oh, those seeds look good. Or this tastes good, doesn't taste starchy at all. You know, so 
you're you're piecing together some of these little factors that are uh, telling you that things are ripe. And then you go into your vehicle and you grab your tarp and you set it up under the drip line where all the fruit is. That way, all the fruit can fall into one collection cloth and, and then be collected way more easily than if you shake onto the earth uh, and have to pick them up one by one. That can be very time consuming. This is a much better way to streamline your harvest. So that's, there's no, nothing technical to say about that other than the fact that it really just, it speeds it up uh, quite a bit. <laughs> and this was a very good harvest from a single tree. There's, uh, yeah, a lot of apples. That was a good one. So um, I see we have some questions in the chat section. I think we should probably get into some of those before we, before we close this up. Um, I don't know if Sean, you want to moderate those at all or if. Yeah, just... sure. Um, although it looks like you got the chat bar open too, which is great. Um, let's, uh, yeah, Mandy's asking, uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts on how to best take care of our apple trees. I planted a few in my yard and want to take care of them organically and naturally. Oh, awesome. Well, it depends on what your what your desired outcomes are. I would I would say that the 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 most important thing is to give the tree what it needs in order to to fruit successfully. Um, if they're older trees, you know, I mean, obviously, it says you, you you said you planted a few in your yard. Um, if they're if they're say two or three years old and still juvenile then uh, we don't have to deal with any kind of treatments that will help the fruit um, you know, mature to ripeness, but we just wanna put all of our effort into growing the healthiest tree possible. So if you're thinking about growing them organically or naturally, I think that the, the generalist approach is that you don't wanna be spraying things. Um, and I am definitely of that mind. I don't spray any apple trees. Um, so for one, I, I try to choose varieties um, and try to, to plant varieties, graft and plant varieties. I find the wild that are going to have that sort of natural selected um, hardiness. Um, but there are a lot of cultivated varieties that have similar um, hardiness. And when you do get into the cultivated setting, you know, thinking about growing a healthy tree, that starts with the soil. So you should really be feeding the tree uh, a lot of composted wood chips. That's a really good thing to help boost the mycorrhizal association in the soil. That's a white fungus that um, help the tree's roots uh, store moisture better, uh, helps um, other soil microorganisms to exchange nutrients that the tree needs. Um, so it helps, it helps the tree basically absorb nutrition as well as uh, maintain moisture. And that can help get trees through drought stress and the drought stressed tree can be susceptible to all different kinds of cankers and borers and pest intrusions that like that weakened tree. So if you just put your effort into growing a healthy, healthy young trees, make sure they've got enough water, lots of healthy composted hardwood chip mulch. Um, and if they need a little extra fertility, if they're in really poor soil, you know, you can put compost down, other, other kinds of things, they'll boost the nitrogen. Um, and if you have trees that are at fruiting age and you really want to make sure that they don't, you know, they don't get knocked off by pests or something early in the year, if you have a lot of trees and you have to do this over a really large area, I would recommend setting up bird boxes and um, bat boxes because they're going to take care of your insect, insect populations. If you get the right kind of bird species going in there, um, robins are really obviously very important, chickadees, um, but woodpeckers and warblers are also really important. So if you can cultivate a really healthy bird environment, some of your pest problems are gonna be uh, a little less intense. And bats, they, they take care of some other key insects there. So um, those are just a couple um, pest and soil nutrition pieces of advice, but I have a lot more to say on that. And um, I'll make sure that my email is accessible for all you need. If you have more questions, you can just shoot me an email uh, with any questions more specifically related to your specific orchard or anything. I uh, hope that helps. 
Um, yeah, before we jump into more questions, I just I'll mention that we'll have the recording of this up on our website, uh, eventnaturecenter.org slash presentations. And, and there I can also, beneath the presentation, I'll put Matt's uh, email address. And if there's any resources or anything you want to share with us, I can add it there too. Um, Matt, are there any additional slides or can I go ahead and stop sharing the screen? You can go ahead and stop showing the screen. Great. Um, cool. Um, well, I know that some people need to head out, um, so I'll just say a quick, quick word, and then we can keep going with uh, a lot of the other great questions that have uh, that have come in here. So, um, thanks if, if you are popping out. Thanks very much for tuning in. Um, join us on Friday for something completely different. We're being joined by Brian Pfeiffer to talk about uh, gull identification. Um, and uh, I also want to just send, uh, say one more one more thank you for our, our sponsors: Hunger Mountain Co-op, Onion River Outdoors. Green Best, Capital Copy, Union Mutual. Um, so thanks to all them. Thanks to all of you. And let's jump back into some questions, Matt. Um, so uh, Jamie's asking, every winter, there are uh, pictures of ghost apples that go viral online. Are they real? So if I, if I um, am picturing the posts that you were talking about, it's like the white, like the ghastly white apples that people have been posting. And uh, in fact, there are, quite a few apples out there in fact there are many that have you know seedlings that haven't been discovered yet that are that have that absolutely pale white color um, one of my favorite wild apple discoveries is uh, a tiny not tiny but it's you know it's a crab apple it's probably this big um, that is just totally white porcelain white uh, I call it Thornton Pearls because it's from a town called Thornton and it kind of looks like a pearl. Um, but not only is, is it truly white, um, it is one of many, many apples that have that kind of ghastly pale white color. There's, there's another popular one that, that has been disseminated by a few big national scale nurseries. One of them is called Silken. That's another white apple that people get really stoked about because it's such a shocking thing to look at um yeah yeah it's it's an interesting thing i mean there's there's yeah you say i saw your comment there almost clear yeah there's there's certain apples whose flesh if you cut it open um becomes almost translucent as well um so there's just a lot of like crazy things you apples always surprise me there's there's apples that are you know, white, and then there's apples that are literally like so dark red that they're black. So uh, there's there's a lot of variety out there. Some sometimes very surprising variety. Um, Melanie's wondering if apples that are picked too early, underripe apples, if they'll ripen on their own in storage. Yes, yes, they will. It depends how early they're picked. Um, the 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 fruit needs to reach a certain threshold of the conversion of starches to sugar in order for that trajectory to continue to the point that they actually ripen fully. But that is a, a, a pretty fundamental um, step in the way that we generally, as a society, treat apples uh, and, and most produce. Most produce is, is uh, picked very, very underripe and ripens in storage because you have to um, account for the long period of storage that that fruit uh, or vegetable or whatever will undergo uh, in transit to wherever it's going to be sold. So apples are no different in that way. And the reason why that is, is because apples like other things in the rose family are reactive to ethylene gas. Ethylene gas is the gas that's produced by ripening vegetables and fruits and it causes the apple to mature. So if you have a box of apples or a, a paper bag full of apples and there's some exchange of ethylene gas from the apples themselves or in a refrigerator from a crisper drawer full of carrots or something, that will cause the apples to continue to ripen. And you'll see if you, if you cut one apple open for a week that's been stored, you'll see the seeds gradually turning darker. Um, if you taste it, you'll taste slightly less starch in there. So that's that's a good strategy for, for certain varieties that have a tendency to like drop all their fruit all at once and then turn mealy really fast. You know, you can pick them early and then sort of ease into it a little better. Um, yeah. 
Cool. Um, let's see. Uh, Lisa is wondering if light is the key to keeping an old apple tree alive, um, a tree that's in an old orchard that's now surrounded by big trees. That's a complicated question. Um, the answer is also complicated. The short version is no. Um, it, it takes a lot more than just light to keep an old apple tree alive, um, especially if it's being crowded out by big trees. The light is one issue, but airflow and cumulative disease pressure is another one. Um, when a tree becomes infected with one of the many common apple diseases that is just ubiquitous in the environment, like apple scab or fire blight, um, and the tree is surrounded by uh, sort of the, the buffer of like a forest type canopy, that lack of airflow will cause that disease pressure to keep building up and sort of accumulate. And in an old tree that has um, maybe a weakened immune system or something, um, and tree immune systems, that's real. Um, it, yeah, you, you need to really open things up um, for that airflow. That airflow is very important. However, uh, the light, yeah, you, you can't have an apple tree survive without light. The, the, it'll, it'll really stunt the growth if a tree is growing in a, in, in a shadier environment. So um, it's a complicated answer. You know, keeping old apple trees alive is, uh, that's like my specialty in pruning work and restoration work. And I, I was telling Sean earlier that um, I'm going to be giving uh, another talk in January on restoring old orchards. And I will touch um, on the topic of restoring old apple trees and keeping old apple trees alive in much greater detail um, with a lot, a lot of attention put on exactly what you need to do in order to not only keep an old apple tree alive, but like bring it back to production um, without any freaky pesticides or anything, you know, just, just with pruning and, and cultural practice. So um, hope you'll either join me for that or, or hope that answer gave you what you're looking for. Kind of a related question is like, let's say you're, you're wandering in the woods and you come across a tree that you really like um, and you want to up its production. You kind of do some guerrilla orcharding um, to, to try to get it to produce more often, more plentifully. And, and you know, can you kind of work with, with you know, wild trees to kind of, um, you know, pseudo cultivate them in a sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, most wild apple trees or, or any tree that is um, not being managed actively is more than likely to fall into a rhythm of biennialism, of, of bearing fruit every year um, and, or at, in alternating years is what I meant to say, um, where you'll have a big crop one year and then no crop or very little the next year, so on and so forth. And so if you are interested in um, sort of maintaining and establishing a relationship with a wild apple tree uh, because you're very fond of it, the best thing to do is to make sure that, um, you know, oh, if you need to open up some more light to that tree, that's a very, very good place to start cutting out competing species that might be dealing, uh, you know, you might be dealing with bittersweet, um, other vines that tend to have a very antagonistic effect on wild apple trees. But on a more generalist level, um, pruning the tree regularly uh, that's an important step because apple trees, like other fruit trees, they produce flower buds only on two to four year old wood. So if you have a tree that's basically never been pruned and all of the productive fruitful wood is way at the tips, you know, you, you, um, you're going to get less fruit. It's going to be harder to access. And if you prune the tree, somewhat regularly every year, every couple of years, or even maybe a little less than that even, that there's a stimulative effect to that where the tree will produce more young growth further down the tree that's gonna be more accessible. The younger wood in the trees generally uh, produces the best fruit um, and you'll get more of it more regularly because that, that stimulative effect regulates the tree's production of flower and fruit buds. So you're more likely to pull a tree from that biennial rhythm 
into um, more of an annual fruit bearing rhythm uh, with, with repeated attention, but it's not a short term thing. You gotta be in it for the long game. It's, it's a little bit every year and a long term payoff. Um, the best thing to do would probably be to prune the tree enough that you get some good, good quality scions, which is like the one year old wood that, that people will harvest the cuttings from and graft with. Uh, your best bet might be to try and prune it for a couple of years and get some very high quality scions and graft those and plant plant a tree of that variety that you like in a place that's just more accessible for you. It may be in your home orchard or uh, in a neighbor's orchard or something. Cool, thanks. Yeah. Um, Susan's wondering if there are particular characteristics you look for as you're foraging, for instance, for um, picking apples for cidering. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, in cider, we have this obsession with bitterness and tannins, and that's partly because all of, not all, but the vast majority of the fruit that uh, we have access to is culinary, of a, of a culinary kind of type. Um, if you want to really make a lot of cider, it's not super hard to find a whole lot of Macintosh or Cortland or something that uh, is relatively cheap and whatever. And, and that's okay, but it's not very interesting. It's not going to make your really high quality cider. Uh, if you want to really dial it in, you need to have this some source of tannins and, and bitterness to create a more of a full feeling in the mouth when you drink your nice dry cider. And so bitterness is a really interesting thing as well as acidity. Um, those are my two big things. Um, and that's not unique to me. It's, it's definitely uh, a, an er two areas that, that all cider focused apple foragers are really um, focused on because you need those elements in order to create something unique. You need, some, you need those elements to create something that really uh, c carries dynamics in the in the palette so i have a couple examples here but this is a variety that is just the most absolutely bitter crazy variety um that i've ever tasted it's it's quite acidic but it you, it's so bitter that you can't even perceive the acid almost it's just so aggressively bitter you need about five percent of this apple in a blend to create that that right balance of tannin and bitterness to the rest of the flavors. And you also need your sweets, uh, true sweets, apples that are just very, very high in sugar, not necessarily the kind of sugar that you can taste, but um, sugar that shows up in the, the refractometer, refractometer, which is a device that we use to measure the soluble sugars in solution. And that's the basically the amount of sugar in the fruit that yeast can metabolize and turn into alcohol. So uh, in this particular apple, there's 20, 20 bricks, maybe 19 or 21 in that range bricks. And bricks is the scale, it's a percentage um, of sugar in solution. That's the units that we use. Um, and 20 is extremely high. Uh, maple syrup is like somewhere around 30, 35, depending on how, what grade it is, but um, that goes to show you that this is like a very highly concentrated sweetness. Um, your average grocery store Macintosh might be like nine or 10 degrees bricks. Um, and so you need that element too, because once all that sugar is fermented away, uh, you know, you need to have something to stand on. That's where the bitterness comes in. Um, and then that sweet really, really highly concentrated sweetness will both act to give you a little bit higher alcohol content so that you have more of a wine-like beverage. And uh, also you've got that fruity aromatic kind of thing left over at the end, um, which you don't typically get in the lower bricks thing. So I usually bring the refractometer out in the field with me when I'm foraging. Um, and I rely on just tasting everyone to make sure that it's got that right, that good flavor. But I, I just like apples, so I don't turn away a lot of fruit. <laughs> Most of them I'll bring to the press no matter, no ma unless they taste really god awful. Um, but I've grown to like a lot of the weird eccentric flavors. 
Um, Jamie had, uh, I think it was Jamie had a question that I'm going to tack a follow up onto. Uh, one is, uh, how many Apple varieties are known and described out there? And then the follow up, I guess, more complicated one is, you know, if I find an apple that I think is a cultivated apple and I have no idea what it is, like, how does one even go about trying to figure out what it is and identify it? Okay, two great questions there. So as far as um, how many apple varieties there are, I don't actually have a perfect answer for that because um, there's not like a world world apple variety clock that you can like, that's got a ticker on it that tells you how many we're up to now. New varieties are always being discovered and named. And I, I wrote a, I've written a couple of blog posts or essays about this, which is, really interesting. And that has to do with sort of the threshold of cultivation. That's like what I call it. But all it takes to introduce a new variety is to find a wild apple in the woods, like it, say, I'm going to name it something and give it a name that you refer to it by, and then harvest cuttings and graft it once. If you graft it and plant it elsewhere, and there is now a copy of that original seedling apple tree. That constitutes an introduction of a new variety. Now that doesn't count for anything if you're the only person who grafted it and you you know, live your long happy life and your tree lives its long happy life but then no one really knew what the tree was, you didn't tell anyone and then you die or the tree dies and then that's sort of it. Um, that has happened many, 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 many times throughout history less common but very importantly is when the apples that people like give a name to and graft if though if those varieties become very popular in some some critical mass of people around them plant more of the trees and also enjoy them and you start calling it the same name or even a different name um, and it, it garners attention that's when an apple will really be documented. Um, so I, I say all that to uh, just communicate that there are so many apples that have, have gone through that process of being introduced formally, but not actually documented. We don't have records of them. Um, the ones we do have records of, there are at least 30,000. I think probably that the, the real number is like 60 or 70,000 different apples, but there were at least 10,000 apples going to market in the year 1900 in the United States and Canada. So like, I mean, 10,000 different varieties like that were being sold commercially um, in the year 1900, which is just like crazy. There's so many out there. We have such a tiny slice of that. Um, now in in market use um, but the apples for the most part mo most of them are being grown somewhere in cultivation and being conserved so that's that's a good thing um, but it will take more effort of more people and, and a really a revival of apple growing culture um, in our society for for us to see a similar uh, a similar agro ag agricultural diversity there um, but if you were to find the, no, the follow-up question, if you were to find a tree in the woods and wanted to know what it was, identification is like, it's like, it's like learning humor in a different language. It's like one of the last things that you'll learn. And I feel like personally, I'm just now after like eight years being like obsessed with apples, getting to the point where I'm able to like, you know, actually identify uh, fruit from, you know, fr from trees we believe to be cultivated. Um, that's a skill that takes a long time to develop and it is very, very detail oriented. You can't look at the color of a fruit and say, oh, the skin it has that kind of striping and it really has that, that sort of signature thing to it. I mean, there are a couple apples that have like weird off the wall kind of characteristics that you're like, oh, I can, you know, I know that one smells like bananas, so it's got to be winter banana. 
you know, there's a couple ones like that, but for the most part, even apples off of the same tree can look so different um, from one branch to another uh, on the same tree in the same year that it's not really always easy to just rely on the fruit itself to identify something. You have to look at the total set of circumstances. Um, you have to know where the tree was found, whose farm it was, what the history of that town was, if it was more isolated or if they had access to more like, you know, higher end nursery catalogs back in the time that we think this tree was planted. That's just an example. Um, and then on a more botanical level, you have a lot of things you have to consider like um, cutting open the apple on the transverse plane, meaning you cut it open like this way instead of, instead of like from the stem, that, that kind of, you have to cut both directions of two different apples so that you can see what the seed core looks like, how, how big the core lines are. There's like these tiny elements in an apple that you don't typically think of as having any significant difference between different varieties. But these are the kinds of things that um, are detailed with, with great, great clarity um, in a book like um, Bussey's Encyclopedia here, as well as countless other pomological texts from the past couple centuries. Um, and so learning different like minutia of different varieties is also important in being able to even throw a good guess out there as to what something might be. So um, the answer is enlist the help of someone who knows more than you do. That's what I've been doing for a long time. And I think I'm just beginning to learn enough that I can really make some good ideas. I had a big victory this year where I, I got a couple right. So um, that's, that's a good thing. If you don't have access to someone with that level of knowledge, there are also uh, some like labs that have new genome testing technology where you can like bring them or send like an apple leaf from the tree in question through the mail and they will like run the genome and tell you exactly what that apple is. And it's a little bit like cheating because it devalues the like centuries of pomological mastery that people have poured their lives into, which is like, I don't know, it's kind of sad that you can just like pay a hundred bucks to Washington State University and they can like put it in a machine and tell you in like two seconds what your apple is. But that is another option if you want to go that route. <laughs> Hope that helps. I'd rather put in the, I'd rather put in the 30 years of, of good, <laughs> good, honest work. Yeah, same. Uh, so we're getting on a little on time. I guess we'll just finish with one last question, which I think um, a lot of folks are probably wondering is, is there an online resource that we could turn to for where Apple nerds get together to help each other uh, either identify stuff or locate trees, or is there just like a good online melting pot of Apple nerds? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say that uh, NAFEX, North American Fruit Explorers, that's a great resource, a great forum for more of a discussion-based thing. Um, if you're looking for uh, an answer to a one-off question, NAFEX is your place. If you're looking for more of a community to like talk about growing apples and talk about issues and get answers from people in the community, then I recommend checking out the Holistic Orchard Network. That's run by Michael Phillips, uh, who's a very well-known orchardist and um, writer on orchard health. Um, he's a great resource. So Holistic Orchard Network, if you're into more of that kind of thing. Um, gnarlypippins.com, if you, if you wanna like read some apple philosophy, like and check out some other wild apple-based resources, less of a discussion um, situation, but we have, we have, we've had, have had some really heated discussions and debate on the on the blog on my website gnarlypippins.com can people um, buy your book there too yeah yeah you can buy my books there both of them you've got the wild apple foragers guide and proceedings from the first annual wild apple wild and seedling pomological exhibition both of those are very good very different um as well as hand saws and other gear for your orchard um some swag if you or into wild apple fashion. So um, yeah, I hope that that answers your question. 
Absolutely. Well, um, Matt, thank you so much for sticking around and answering all these great questions. Um, yeah, thank awesome. you guys. Um, thanks again, everybody, for tuning in. Matt, um, it's really been a pleasure. We hope we can bring you back to the Nature Center uh, in, in person one of these days um, to do some more work with us on pruning and head out to some uh, some some wild apple stands together. And, uh, and hopefully this isn't the last we see of you. Um, awesome. Yeah, thank thanks you. a lot, Sean. Yeah. Um, I'll put up this online. I'll add in uh, Matt's email address and, and the uh, websites that I just referenced there. And, and uh, so feel free to, to check up on our website for all, all, the, all that stuff. So um, thanks everybody. Have a great night and uh, thank you again, Matt. Thanks guys. Take care.